I'm going to leave class today. That is finished class today at quarter past five. I think it's good you have the time to meditate. Just have a break, take a break. It's been a lot today. So we won't have a break. We'll just continue all the way through, if that's okay with you. Um, until quarter past, quarter past five, you have a small break. And then have a meditation for half an hour. Great. Um, so I was going to take some questions. I have some lying here. Can you please explain how to meditate on the emptiness of the mind? If that can wait, whoever wrote this. I recognize the, vo- uh, the, the handwriting, but I don't know, I don't know who put it here. Um, anyway, I'll leave it here. And if it doesn't come up at some point, um, then please remind me. But that has, less, it has to do with the mind, of course, but that's more going into practice and as a means towards understanding emptiness and so forth. Uh, could you please recommend your favorite books and documentaries? Oh. <laughs> Those that you find very inspiring. Well, they change all the time. <laughs> I read something and I go, wow, this is my favorite one now. And then I could read the name, and then that's my favorite. Um, documentaries. Mm. Books. I mean, books, guys, hold me. I mean, I, can, I cannot name any Tibetan books, um, so <laughs> that wouldn't work. So English books. I don't read that many English Dharma books, but uh, for instance, I read How to See Yourself as You Really Are by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. That's really good. In fact, any book by His Holiness is really good. Um, even though I haven't read that many, but the ones I actually at least looked through have always been amazing. Of course. Uh, very reliable, very uh, on top of things, explained well. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're asking about Dharma books, not. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't really get the time to read anything else. It's just I, I like to read other things. I just never get the time. And then uh, documentaries. Well, again, I really like the ones to do with what I've learned about the Dharma. So I never remember their names really. Um, oftentimes, they're just short clips from from. Uh, documentaries. There's one, I actually have it. Most most monks and nuns, I think, have it. It's about like sense perception. It's about the gorillas that show up in the middle of the thing, but you never expect them to be there. And then later on, they ask you, how many gorillas were there? <laughs> and I actually noticed one, because I didn't feel like counting the guy doing the basketball thing. I was like, ugh. And I just didn't count it. You know, they told us to count how many times he... And then I saw this gorilla going through, and I was like, why is there a gorilla? <laughs> Just because I didn't pay attention to what they told us to do. So I noticed the gorilla. <laughs> but just for different reasons, just because I just wasn't paying attention. Um, so that was a really good one. But what is it called? I don't know. It's about optical illusions. It's about the hand, you know, the mirror image and how you can fool. This is not the one with the... No, it's also about the attention, right? Because you're paying attention to the dribbles, you're not supposed to notice. Yeah, it's an awareness to which, with regard to the monkey, it becomes awareness to which the object appears but is not ascertained. It is not with regard to what you actually perceive, but just with regard to those objects. And then it goes on about a lot of different things, like sense perceptions, how magicians can steal your watch while they keep you engrossed in a conversation to actually take off your, 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 your wristwatch. The Brain by David Eagleman, that one? That six-part series about the brain? Oh, I don't think it's a series. Not that one. No, I, d- I think it's just a one single. It's probably a little bit. <laughs> no, it's not the, 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 the what the belief do we know? No, no, it's not that one. Yeah, that was quite famous too in the Buddha's world, but I only watched it once, and I don't remember what I thought about it. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry, I can't really. There's just bits and pieces that I usually don't remember the title of the, the documentary because oftentimes it's just I, I, go, I Google something. I don't have real access to movies and stuff. So I go online, I like Past and Future Live Remembrance, and then you have like 10 YouTube videos, and I watch them. So, <laughs> well, not all of them, but <laughs> depending on what I like. And in the end, I don't remember. I don't remember what they were all about, but I don't remember the, their names, their titles. So anyway, I'll look for the, the documentary that I mentioned. It's really interesting about optical illusions, about how our mind uh, basically contributes our preconception, contributes to our perception 
etc. So that, there's a lot of stuff online nowadays. I mean, anyway. Okay, so other questions? Ooh, that was pretty simultaneous. But she started already p raising her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is more a clarification. Okay, go ahead. Um, so uh, certainly th in that um, appearance, object is there as well as apprehending or is it just appearance? Say again. When you, when you don't ascertain. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. An awareness to which the object appears but is not ascertained. Is there only an appearance or is there also some kind of apprehension? Yeah. They say there's some type of apprehension too, because the mind automatically holds something. But there's no awareness of that. So I find that puzzling. Like, yeah, you apprehend something, but then you kind of don't. <laughs> so it's never been very satisfactory to me. It's kind of just insisting the mind always apprehends something. But then again, you're not aware of it. You don't realize that. So how can you say you apprehend something? And I haven't found any satisfactory answer. But in general, it is what you say. And it, with regard to... We actually distinguish, making it a little bit more complicated. We distinguish between, for instance, an awareness that focuses on... That is, it doesn't. It itself doesn't focus so much. But this, let's say, you have a table in front of you, right? You have a table in front of you. So the eye consciousness, the eye sense power, is directed towards the table, and you're not paying attention at all. You're busy listening, listening to, I don't know, some music, for instance. So in that moment, the the degree of attention that comes along with this eye consciousness is not sufficient. Most, your, the attention that's directed at your ear consciousness, that is so much stronger. So therefore, although your mind being directed at the table in front of you, or your, your eye sense power being directed at it, therefore your eye consciousness is an awareness apprehending a table, but you're not, it doesn't register. It's like, the register is not a good word, but it doesn't, it doesn't realize, it doesn't know the table. It's like when you're just staring at something and without seeing anything in that sense. So you say the mind apprehends the object because it must apprehend something. That's what it does. But what apprehends the table, it's not known by the mind. The mind is not aware of that. Okay. I don't know. Is it not aware of it? No, it's not aware of it in that moment. But it still apprehends it. So what does that mean? I can't, I can't tell you what that exactly means because from my own experience I can only tell you that I have these minds all the time but when they're not active I can't say anything about them now here in this case you have an awareness the main object is that which you're facing basically in the case of an eye consciousness or ear consciousness whatever sound hits your ear drums basically so that, or whatever that is that hits your eardrum, whichever pressure wave, that translates into your, your consciousness perceiving sound, but you're not aware of it. It's just an apprehension of that. Okay, there's, that's with, the, with regard to the main object. But there's also another way in which, for instance, when you actively perceive the table, you do see the table. So your main object is the table. You're not distracted. You perceive the table. And therefore, this mind is not an awareness to which the object appears but is not ascertained. But it is such an awareness with regard to the subtle particles. So, with regard to its main object, it's not an awareness to which the object appears but is not ascertained. So, because what the mind is, is determined by its main object. Okay, Its main object being the table or whatever is in the sphere of vision... That is the main object, in particular, if you focus on something particular. Okay? That becomes your main object. And then, dependent on that, if it realizes its object, it's a valid cognizer. If it doesn't realize its object, it's an awareness of which object appears, but it's not ascertained. Okay? If its object doesn't exist, if, it's that, if there's a table, but you perceive that to be a bed, uh, it becomes an awareness of which object appears, but it's not ascertained. So, sorry, it becomes a wrong consciousness. It becomes a wrong consciousness. Okay. So, with regard to that, so with regard to its main object, it is any of those. Then we look at the appearing object, right, and check. 
does every appearing object exist? If just one of them doesn't exist, it becomes a mistake in awareness on top of everything else. Okay? So with regard to being mistaken or not, we're no longer checking out the, the main object of apprehension, but rather we take an appearing, any of anything that appears to the mind. If there's any mistaken aspect, then we describe that as a mistaken consciousness. Why do we do that? Why, why, why not be consistent? Why not stick to just object of apprehension? In order to show that a mind can have mistaken appearances and nonetheless be fully functioning. So we have these mistaken appearances. They do affect us, such as inherent existence, but we can still know an object and still function in this world. So to show that, this category has been created, I guess. And then you could also say with regard to certain appearing objects, if they merely appear, such as the, the, the subtle particles, then with regard to those subtle particles, it is also an awareness to which the object appears but is not ascertained. But since whether in general it is an awareness to which the object appears but is not ascertained is determined by the object of apprehension and not by just a minor or a secondary object of appearance, you wouldn't call that an awareness to which the object appears but is not ascertained. That's it. So I know this is complicated, but honestly, if you write down what I've just said and you memorize it, that's it. Right? <laughs> just how the words are used. That's it. It's really not that complicated. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Yes. Now go ahead. Sorry. Uh, okay, so, so I have this, uh, it's kind of a, uh, we discussed it as well in our discussion group. Okay. So a question which is, when we have the two, the two divisions, uh, correct and wrong consciousness, mm -hmm. and as well valid and non-valid. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So both of them are with respect to the object of apprehension. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of them, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the distinction between correct and valid would be uh, the way the object is apprehended. It could mm -hmm. be any of the... Yep. Uh, it doesn't need to be realized. Yes. And then with valid and non-valid, the object needs to be realized. Mm -hmm. However, my problem is that we, our baseline is apprehending everything as objectively existent. Not apprehending that everything. We don't apprehend everything as objectively existent. But it only appears. Okay, but we, we don't. Okay, it only appears. However, most of the time, unless we analyze it, mm -hmm. we act, and from there, all our misconceptions and all our problems and suffering and samsara, right? They, they, from there, they stand that we, to everything we relate as being permanent and existing of, of, of it from its own side. Well, no, the, you have to have a mental consciousness. The sense consciousness is no, never okay, apprehended. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the, then the mental, mental consciousness. Right? Only the mental consciousness. Yes. So every now and then. There's a wrong consciousness that wrongly apprehends its main object to exist inherently. That is like, when you think of the table, if you think of yourself, that you, you perceive as, you apprehend yourself to exist inherently. Yes. That's a wrong consciousness. Yes, but uh, isn't that like happening the whole time? I don't think it happens all the time. Pretty often. But it's not ever, it's not, it's not ever present. For instance, when we're asleep, it's not always present. I mean, you have to be... You have to be dreaming for it to be there. I don't think your subtle mind, the subtle mind that's subtler than the dreaming consciousness manifests in that form. And sometimes, if you just meditate on love and compassion, I don't think... It's influenced by that mind when it lies dormant. It is influenced by it. We just discussed that before, that certain awarenesses are not manifestly present. They're not there. So, the, but they still influence our perception of other things. Exactly. The appearance is still there. The appearance, but you're not actively apprehending it that way. So, when we are not actively apprehending something to be objectively existent, mm -hmm. this uh, apprehension we call it if if if, if it's in accordance mm -hmm. with the object exists, mm -hmm. we call it correct yes. or valid, depending on which mind we use, whether it's incontrovertible knower or it's just yeah. uh, apprehension. So, just if its object exists, it is correct. If on top of the object existing, you also incontrovertibly know, know it. it, you call it a valid cognizer. And when mm -hmm. it's a mental consciousness, when we incontrovertibly know it, it doesn't need to be only with relations to how things exist, but it could be incontrovertibly knowing a fire to be uh, uh, because of smoke, yes. that there is fire. Yes. So we can 
Yes, yeah, so you can just know general things. You can infer that there are sm- when there's smoke, there's fire. You can r- remember you've done something yesterday and realize what you've done yesterday through memory. Not every memory is reliable, but the, the fact you were here in class yesterday. If I ask you, were you in class yesterday? And you answer with yes. It's because you had a mental consciousness confirming, a memory confirming you were in this classroom. You had this tiny, small moment. You're not even aware of this small moment. You're not aware. This is the thing. We're not aware of it. But you're aware, that even without being aware, the fact that you can confirm you were in this class yesterday is because there was a short moment of you realizing with memory that you were in this classroom. It's not inferential. It's not direct. And still you realize something. So unless we engage actively on a wrong perception that things exist of its own side, we can, uh, for example, when, when, when I think of a table and I have a main mental image of a table, mm-hmm. that's a correct yes. mind. Yeah. Just because I don't engage actively, actively in thinking this is inherently existent table. Yeah. You just think so of table. I say this is table, yeah. that makes it correct. Yeah, because this is, co- I mean, if this, well, if you point at this object and not at the cup, yes, that makes it correct. And then you have a generic image of what is conventionally called a table, because it's what you, what you, what to you a table means, yeah. right? What to you a table means is this object here and not the cup. Unless you start using the word table for this cup, then you're wrong saying this is a yeah, table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, you know what I mean. Conventionally. Conventionally, yes, 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 yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, you haven't said that much. Yeah. Uh, with the right motivation, mm-hmm. could you have a direct perceiver experience of a hidden phenomenon with the help of like, a controlled substance or a drug? <laughs> <laughs> this always comes up at some point. <laughs> Magic mushrooms! <laughs> <laughs> People are very uh, curious about magic mushrooms, and, 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 and rightly so. <laughs> but I mean, I've heard firsthand, and I've read there, there's a lot more. Yeah, more drugs study. than that. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes, I th- maybe yes, possibly. Um, there are also accounts of great Tibetan masters who use certain substances in their meditation. There are those accounts. So as far as I remember, Lama Zubarimpachi in his previous life was a great tantric practitioner. As far as I know, he also used alcohol. Oh. Yes, I've heard that. But! <laughs> 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 but! <laughs> so, actually, this needs to be really explained in a certain context. When high lamas do this, they're not if they have a monastic vow. They don't. They, they try to make sure not to break their vow, and many practitioner has given have given back their vows, not because they just really fell in love with this girl, but rather because they wanted to practice do certain practices, and not, and even though their sum, consumption of alcohol was for a very good reason, as an example, they didn't want to break that vow. Be a good example, gave back their vow and did these practices. They were then lay practitioners. Okay, so and they were really highly advanced. They could totally control their body and therefore use these substances to such a degree that they didn't have a bad trip or something, okay, and didn't get addicted, etc. Now, therefore, it's important those are means that you only can start utilizing when you're highly realized in general. Now, with these drugs, I've heard about this a little bit. I read a little bit about it. I've been asked about it numerous times that people have certain experiences through these drugs. And in fact, a lot of people say that uh, in the 70s, when a lot of Westerners were attracted to Buddhism, was because they were possibly somewhere else before, uh, took some drugs, kind of had some experience, and wanted to explore this further. Yeah, I mean, in a way, nice it happened to them. Good that it happened to them. I'm just talking about that, not the direct experience. So having that experience, but the danger is you're playing with fire. If it's not totally controlled and if for some reason you react differently, you have a bad trip. And I've heard some people, sometimes they don't come out of it for a month at a time. So I've heard from a friend of a friend that he had a bad trip and for a month he was out of his mind. I don't know whether it's worth the risk, 
versus just coming here without having taken the drugs and doing the meditation and having a similar experience, except it takes a little longer, and it lasts maybe a little longer, because it was not drug-induced. So if people are interested in that, they should be supervised, there should be someone with them, and I still think that's a huge risk while doing certain practices, it's the lesser risk. And I don't know whether it's worthwhile. Now, I, dr I don't know whether really taking drugs would lead you to a direct experience. If you had that experience already in a previous life, and due to disruptions in this life, it just can't come through right away, then of course it may be triggered by that drug. But again, it's not necessary if you, uh, you could trigger it in a different way. So as monks and nuns, we have a vow, no intoxicants. Like, no matter what, no intoxicants. There is a reason for that, because there's a funny story that goes along with that. Funny, do you have heard the story? It's about a monk who lived up in the mountains, and a beautiful lady came to see him and said, uh, come on, let's fool around. And he's like, no, I have a vow of celibacy, I cannot you know, have sex with you? Okay. So she walked off quite disappointed. She came back with a goat the next day and she said, let's at least kill the goat and have a good meal. And he's like, no, can't. I mean, I'm a monk. I cannot kill another living being, so I cannot do that. So please go away. So she went away. And the third day she came with some beer. And she's like, well, you didn't want to have sex with me. You didn't want to kill the goat. Let's at least drink some beer. So he was like, okay, well, you know, I've, I've turned her away so many times, I might as well, you know, have some beer. So they had the beer, killed the goat, and it said. <laughs> <laughs> so you see the story, what's behind it. So there's this great danger that we can no longer control our mind. That's why uh, the abstaining from, from intoxicants is so important. Whether the story is true or not, but we can all we know all what it's all, what that is about. Therefore, is it worth the risk that in the end, even if it's not alcohol but other drugs, that can be potentially very harmful and you can create greater damage? So, as monks and nuns, we're not allowed to take any intoxicants. Coffee is not included. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. It's not. No, no, I don't think it is. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yes, Nikita? Uh, just a clarification from our discussion group um, about mistaken consciousness. Uh -huh. So, and also something you just said. Um, so, mistaken consciousness is something that, like, inherently doesn't exist from its own side. That's one. one I Oof, think. Mistaken consciousness mm -hmm. doesn't inherently exist from its own and side. Yes, you're yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one form of mistaken consciousness. It is mistaken since. That which appears, appears to be inherently existent, while it is not. Therefore, we say an awareness that has that appearance must be a mistaken awareness. A mistaken is there awareness. any other form of mistaken consciousness? Sure, perceiving a flying cow. Yeah. The mind that perceives a flying cow, what appears to it? The, a flying cow. Therefore, with regard, since that appearance is impossible, that the, that, that appearance does not accord with reality, therefore it's in a mistaken mind. So really, all you need... Pardon? I thought it's wrong. It would also be wrong. It's, wrong. it's both wrong and mistaken. Since it is wrong, it's mistaken. If it's wrong, it must be mistaken. If it is mistaken, it doesn't have to be wrong. Right? If it's Why? Because your main object also appears. If you have any mistaken appearance... Any, any, anything, any aspect of that mind, if something appears to it that is not realistic, then by definition you have a, that is a mistaken mind. We are talking about fantasy, all the kind of fantasies? Like when we are talking about object that doesn't exist. A fantasy, well, it depends on the fantasy. You see, the thing I, s I mentioned earlier, when you know you're just making it up, when you're fantasizing, but you know you're making it up, Although its object is not existent, but since you do it intentionally, some would say, well, actually, then you don't need to call it a wrong consciousness. We haven't really mentioned this category. It's usually not mentioned. They always say, if the mind, if its object doesn't exist, or if the mind is perceiving it in a way in which it doesn't exist, it's a wrong consciousness. But then later on, you, you're told, if you meditate, 
for instance, you do Donglen, that is not realistic. That is a fantasy. You're taking the suffering of all sentient beings, but it's highly effective. Okay? When you do certain tantric, I mean, when you visualize the 17 panditas, they're not in front of you. At least not the way you visualize. So, if they're there, not in the form we visualize. So, or we don't know. Basically, so if, if they're not actually there, then basically we can say that is not in accordance with reality. So, fantasy, but if you have a fantasy, like a hallucination, that's a wrong consciousness. Okay? So, there's a difference. Right? Yes, wrong. You you only check the uh, the object of your apprehension. Mistaken, you check the appearing object. But since the object of apprehension, the main object of apprehension, is also always appearing, therefore whatever is a wrong consciousness must also be mistaken. Does that make sense? Why whatever is a wrong consciousness must be mistaken? Because if you perceive, for instance, my main object is the mind, the the, the flying cow. I have an appearance of a flying cow. You couldn't wrongly perceive a flying cow if, if, if something didn't appear. Right? You have an appearance of horns of a rabbit. You have an appearance of the train moving instead of you moving, for instance, or the other way around. If you're standing, if you're standing still and the other train is moving and you think you're moving, for instance, you have that appearance. It appears to the mind. And then you wrongly apprehend that. Because you wrongly apprehend it is a wrong consciousness, but since that which you wrongly apprehend must appear to the mind, because it's your main object, it's also a mistaken mind. So then the correct mistaken would be an example of... Pardon? Like correct mistaken? Anything. Any mind you, you have in your continuum. An eye consciousness perceiving the table. So basically everything is mistaken. Yes. Every mind in our continuum, unless you realize emptiness directly... Because that's the first time, when you realize emptiness directly, when you experience it directly for the mm -hmm. first time, then at that moment, there's no appearance of inherent existence. Therefore, your mind is a correct mind, plus it is non-mistaken. So then I don't understand the difference between wrong, like example, now everything is mistaken, uh -huh. correct? So then what would I say is the difference between a mistaken consciousness and a wrong consciousness? Oh, again? No, because you said that the example that you were given for yourself. Look, if the if it's if the main object of the mind, I'll give you. I go okay. Just ch when I say I consciousness perceiving table, right? What is the main object? The table. table. Does a table exist or not? Yes. 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 When I say I consciousness perceiving horns of a rabbit, does the horns of a rabbit exist or not? No. no. Wrong consciousness, right? Now, every time I specify in that way. I check object existed or not. That's it. Object of apprehension. But as you know, the appearance, right? The appearance is inherent existence of the appearance. And that is always there. So even though when I specify which mind I'm talking about, I'm not specifying what is the main object. I know if it's not a Buddha, that is the, then the appearance of inherent existence must be there. I just got confused because you said, like literally five minutes ago, yeah. you said, Inherently exist, which is a wrong consciousness. No, no, no. The mind that ap actively apprehends, that actively apprehends that the I inherently exists, that is a wrong consciousness. Because I've said not just appearing, I didn't say the mind to which the I appears inherently, I said the I that apprehends the I uh, uh, inherently. So there it's become the object of apprehension. And if the object of apprehension doesn't exist, the mind is a wrong consciousness. Just bring the two together, right? The two together. Apprehension determines what you apprehend and whether that exists or not determines wrong or not. Appearance determines mistaken or not. So just check, right? I know it's confusing. It's confusing. It's just as confusing for me. So it's really just a memory. It's not so much you, you understand it, except you forget apprehension versus, yeah. Yes, please. Yes. I know, I remember you. Yes. Mm -hmm. A second question. Okay, we all know how we experience inherent existence because we all know how it is. We are separate from me, etc. But how is it when we experience not inherent existence? <laughs> like, what is, like, how the Buddha perceives, then we say, okay, connect, okay, we should be perceiving like this. Oh, okay, okay. We basically say, 
basically, I think what you're saying is like, why should we wish to become a Buddha? We don't even know what that feels like, right? <laughs> no? It's like, how is it when we're not perceiving inherent? Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. we have direct experience of emptiness. How yes. is it? <laughs> 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 we are debating wrong, correct, but how is it when it's totally right? <laughs> okay. Imagine you're blind. Okay? You're blind. So now I'm blind, you're blind, and you ask me, what is it like to see blue? <laughs> right? I can always say, well, once you're no longer blind, let me know what it's like. <laughs> so in the same way, I said to you, well, one day when you realize emptiness before me, right, when you realize it directly and I haven't, please let me know. <laughs> okay, but when you, sa you said something interesting in the very beginning when you started your question, you said, we all know what inherent existence means. <laughs> I think what you meant was we have some sense of what it means, right? So, actually, in order to realize emptiness, there's one first step required that's really important. That step is called identifying the object of negation. That's the hardest thing to do. How much, what is it that we negate? What is, which part are we saying is not there? Be Yes, you're right, but... <laughs> no, no, she's right behind. <laughs> so, it's, no, no, it's behind. So, <laughs> it's inherent existence, of course, but what does that refer to? It's so easy to say inherent existence. It's just a word. We use it in everyday life. To, let me, to, to tell you something, just as a side remark, I mean, that's also really important. Because we say uh, the United States is an independent country. We say, look at the situation objectively. I want to be more independent. We use all these words, right? Being wet is inherent in water. So when we say in Buddhism, there's no inherent existence, does all of what we say, all everything else that we say, does that become untrue? No, 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 no. Because when we say the United States is an independent country, we don't mean it exists totally independent. We mean in relation to a particular political situation or a financial situation, it doesn't depend on other countries. But it's not totally independent. That would be ridiculous. When we say, let's look at the situation, let's look at it um, objectively. We don't mean like, don't use a mind to look at it. No, we mean let's, let's leave aside any kind of strong emotional response without allowing a strong emotional response to come in. Let's try to see it more rationally. That's usually what is meant. You cannot see something totally objectively. And th thirdly, inherent, well, wetness is inherent in water. Being hot is not inherent in water. You need other causes and conditions to heat up water. And we say water naturally comes with wetness, right? But actually, you still need other factors for water to be... Uh, you still need other factors for water to be wet. It depends on other factors other than itself. It depends on oxygen and hydrogen. And not, neither of those are water. Fire, heat, we say it's naturally hot. It's inherently hot. But it still depends on oxygen, and it depends on other things other than itself to make it hot. So actually, this, it's not inherently in and of itself hot, because it depends on lots of other things to make it hot. So therefore, we say inherently only from the point of view that we don't need to contribute to make fire hot, for instance, right? Versus warm water, we need to, you know, make a fire or something needs to make a yeah, we need fire to make it warm. It's not like it naturally appears that way. So you see how we use these words from our everyday language that actually mean something quite different and now use, try to use them, borrow them, okay? Saying, if the way this table appears to me, if that were true, the way, if that appearance were in accordance with reality, then it'd be totally independent. I'm not just saying independent from the point of view of A, B, and C. No, totally independent. If it really existed the way it appears to me, 
even if there were no mind, no awareness to perceive it, it would exist ex exactly in that way. And if it existed inherently as a table, you wouldn't need anything, nothing to make it a table. It wouldn't depend on oxygen and, and gravity and all that. It, it just would be a table. Okay? So those, that's what we really mean with the object of negation. And that is so hard to understand. I believe we have a gross sense of what that means. But the moment you start analyzing further, you start thinking, how do I, how do I bring the two together? I do exist, but not inherently. Then we fall into the extreme of either nihilism, there's nothing there, or there must be something there. It's very easy, you see, what we start off with is like you start searching for a table. The first step is easy. If I look for the table among the table, I look, I take it apart, I don't find a table, that is not that difficult to understand that. That's not said to be emptiness, because that's not... That's not that hard. Do you look? You take it apart and you don't find a table. Take each part, look whether it exists outside. Is it all the parts? No, it's not all the parts because we see a table, but we don't see all the parts. We break a part and the table breaks, but we don't break all the parts. So there's a lot of reasoning that allows us to, to check we can't find the table. But we don't stop there. We then take the parts and look for a surface. Look for a surface, don't find a surface. And then we take the parts that make up the surface and look for something that makes up those parts and we don't find those. And you can go on infinitely. Infinitely. You never find anything that when you focus in on it, it's that is the thing. You always find something other than that. And at some point you're saying like, what? what? How can I have a table? How can I, out of nothing, there's nothing there, and I have this table. How can that be possible? So when you reach that point, you're actually moving closer towards the object of negation. Right? You come to this conclusion because for us, existence and inherent existence are the same. We don't know really what that refers to. So basically, we need to identify exactly without negating the existence, the conventional existence of the table, we still need to Find something that is separate from the mere conventional existence, which also means we need to understand how the table depends on so many factors other than itself and also dependent on us calling it a table. And then we have the difficulty, well, before mm -hmm. anyone called something the moon, was there a moon or not? And we have to answer yes. And still it's merely labeled. How do you account for that? Because with time, we now get caught up in time in order for it to be a moon now, it needs to be labeled moon now. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. That seems contradictory, right? It's a big problem people face a lot. Like before there was, they talk about, there was this planet a million years ago and no one called it this planet. So was the planet there or not? Sure, because now we call it that. We talk about the planet a million years ago. So therefore, retrospectively, it's still okay to say it's a labeled, merely labeled planet. It didn't have to be that planet a million years ago um, to... It didn't have to be called this planet a million years ago to say it existed. So that's an extra difficulty because we get caught up in time. For some of you, this may not be an issue yet, but if you do a meditation course, sooner or later you'll face that problem. So, therefore, all these problems and difficulties you face while trying to identify the object of negation. To, to be able to come to a conclusion, this much I need to negate, because it's not existent, but this much, if I negate that, I'm negating too much. And then once you really reach that, then negating it is not that difficult, right? But only once, you see, the moment we use language, the moment we describe things, language, you express something, and you, to, but to ask the words in themselves, they suggest inherent existence. Because when they appear to our mind, they appear to our conceptual consciousness, and again, the appearance of inherent existence is there. This is why emptiness is beyond words. Right? When you then experience it, the moment you, you have a word appear while you're perceiving emptiness, emptiness is just a negation. But a neg if you negate too much, it's not emptiness. 
but it must be a negation where nothing positive appears. If something positive appears, something other than emptiness appears, it'll appear as inherently existent, and therefore you've lost it. You've lost emptiness. So, therefore, using language, the moment you use language, then something positive appears to the mind. The word in itself is a conventional truth, and that always appears to us inherently. The moment you use a word, it appears inherently. So, therefore, it's even indescribable. You can't describe it. You can't express emptiness. They say it's inexpressible. To a certain degree, the, the, the taste of chocolate is also inexpressible, of course, but for a different reason. But the experience of emptiness, if you try to put it into words, unless you have already a realization of emptiness, if I explain to you what emptiness is, it will always appear to you as if inherently. Of course, if I explain it, I, don't, I can't explain it because I haven't realized it. But if someone like His Holiness, who I'm pretty sure has realized emptiness, explains it, he can only go so far with these words because these words will suggest inherent existence to you while as long as it's trying to convey to you the lack of inherent existence. So in the end, it's beyond words. Even if you ask his holiness, someone who knows what emptiness is like, when you realize it, his holiness can only go that far because the moment he uses words, for him the appearance is not there, but for you the appearance is there. So words can only go that far. This is why all you can do is Think about what you can take from the words, take it further, and continue on meditating until you have your own experience, and then you are unable to, con to, to, <laughs> to completely convey it to, to others. You know, I remember there was once I had an audience with a lama, his name is Zonsa Kenserobuchi. He's really amazing, but I didn't know at that time. I, I was like, ugh, Zonsa Kenserobuchi. He's the movie lama. <laughs> what a lama, ugh. I was like, like, I really, I, I was very arrogant. I just thought, oh, he's not behaving like a lama. He's making movies, right? No, 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 no. Don't say Kenzo Rinpoche. He wrote the book. What does it mean to not be a Buddhist? He's really famous. He's from the Sakya. That is, see, he's part of the Sakya, but also Nyingma tradition. Like he's a reincarnation of a very famous Nyingma master. Anyway, very famous and great teacher. Amazing, unconventional teacher. So funny and so amazing. But anyway, I had, we had this audience with a group of students, and I happened to be there, and I was like, ugh. Like, I, mean, I mean, just in my mind, I didn't show that. But <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's how I felt, right? And then he said, like, one of the first things he said was, the Buddha diluted the teachings. And I was like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, the movie lama is putting down the Buddha. <laughs> Total conf confirmation of what I thought. <laughs> no, but then he said, what he said, uh, it blew my mind, and I never forgot. And my, my opinion of him switched, what is it, 180 degrees, 100, not 360, no, 180 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> it turned 180 degrees, like, wow. He said, the Buddha diluted the teachings. What he did was, it's like, it's a bit like he gave the analogy of a laser beam. We cannot see a laser beam. Okay? We cannot see it. Our sense consciousnesses don't allow us. That is like the truth. That's the truth. That's the Dharma. But you can spray paint on it. So you don't see the laser beam, but you see the paint. That is as close as you get. We use words that never convey emptiness completely because they suggest inherent existence. But it's like with this laser beam. Until we learn, our mind has become so flexible that we can perceive the laser beam ourself, until that time we use the paint, we use the words that take us thus, that, thus far. But of course, this is why there's so much emphasis, don't rely on just the words. Mm -hmm. Take those words, that's the closest you can get, and then try to, through meditations, try to develop your own experience. And only once two people have realized emptiness directly, they can communicate. That's like two people seeing blue, they can discuss blue. If you haven't seen blue and I haven't seen blue, it's, it, we can kind of get as close as, that we, close as we can get, but we have to eventually really come to the understanding. So therefore, this, even if I could answer this question, and of course I cannot, I haven't realized emptiness, not even conceptually, so my explanation is just from what I learned in the texts and from thinking about it, from my teachers giving me, answering my questions, etc. So I have a rough sense of it, but no understanding. And that's why it's the one thing we need to understand, that we can understand, 
but it takes a lot of time. I started, I stopped my last session with a kind of passionate statement, you know, like, Buddhism shouldn't just be a hobby, etc. I didn't mean to put pressure on you. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, if you find it useful, bring it into your own life. Bring it into your own life. And bring it into your own life is to check again and again, for instance, what is the I? To make it a point every day to remember and reflect and reflect and reflect. And then you will eventually come to know it. And the more obstacles you face, the greater you will progress. The more obstacles you will face, the greater you will progress. Okay? So Jitsu Martin Zapama once said it. And it was on a t-shirt. I saw one, someone walking in front of me with that t-shirt. She said, if you want to form a piece of wood... You don't take a piece of cotton, you take, sand, you take sandpaper. It's rough, but you very quickly can form the, the, the wood. Versus cotton, it takes forever. So obstacles, problems, and difficulties, sometimes we don't want to practice the Dharma because it's noisy, because you know we have, we have an idea of all these perfect circumstances, and if I had all these perfect circumstances, then I would go into retreat. But trust me, if you had all of those, you would be so bored... And you still wouldn't go into a retreat. So it's, it had nothing to do with the external circumstances. It has to do with your determination and your sense, I'm going to do this no matter what. Any obstacle, bring them on. Mm -hmm. right? And if you have that, certain, that degree of determination because you can see the benefit, then you bring it into your everyday life. You bring it into every situation. You're ever ready. And you will realize emptiness, even if you work on Wall Street. Because you're utilizing every situation, you're utilizing it to understand emptiness. Of course, it's more conducive to live in a monastery versus Wall Street, <laughs> but only if you're not determined enough. I believe if you're determined enough, no matter where you are, uh, you can do it, right? And sometimes people who, are, who have greater hardships, they, can, they, they are more spiritual. The more hardship you experience, no matter where you are, the more... It can, of course, crush you, but it can also lead to, <laughs> lead to, and that's up to us. I mean, the, you have to think about things and reflect and be mindful, etc. And then eventually, even those horrible circumstances, they can become a cause um, to your development. Like I told you about my friend, her, her adversity, everything went wrong, and she saw the whole experience as a purification. Uh, she even thought. She kept thinking, like, may my, my pain increase his wholeness's life? May I, through this experience, if there's any obstacle to his wholeness life, may, may this serve as re removing it? So she said it was a very blissful experience. Right? So, sorry, that was a really long answer, but it needs to be put into perspective. Okay? Yes. Yes. So, uh, so I, I was wondering, to what extent does karma influence our future? Ah, okay. How much is their free will and how much is their karma? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pardon? Free will is just something we stuck from the Christian, but it's not even in Dharma. Like well, free will exists. But there is a problem with how we define free will. Free will exists in Buddhism. It exists. But not the type that we think of in the West. What is the type we think of in the West? Free will is making a decision independent of anything. Well, there's no independent existence. What kind of free will would that be? Right? You couldn't make a decision because you'd be stuck in free will. Right? Just free will. You couldn't depend on it. <laughs> so, therefore, an interdependent free will, a relative free will, relative, okay? I said... For instance, independence doesn't exist. So the United States, as an example, is independent with regard in relation to A, B, and C. You can talk about a free will in relation to something. Do I have the free will right now to lift my right hand? Yes, I do. But if someone chopped off my right hand, I wouldn't have the free will with regard to lifting my right hand. So with regard to that, I would missing... I would miss out on that free will in relation to that. But I still have the free will to raise my right hand. No, it's left hand, sorry. <laughs> I still mix those two up. Right hand, left hand, right? Okay. 
So it's in relation to having a choice, right? Raising or not raising. And sometimes you have that choice and sometimes you don't. In relation to that, we say we have free will. Is that independent? No, I need a body to make that decision. I need a mind to make that decision. It doesn't exist independently. How can I make a decision if I don't have a mind and a body, etc.? So you see, it's always dependent on something. Now, therefore, I can make decisions which are relative decision, f relative free will, relative independent will. Free is just another word for independent. So, then, in answer to what is karma and what is not, well, karma... And this is like a little bit difficult because, of course, not surprising. On a subtlest level, it's extremely hidden. It's extremely hidden. So how do we know? Not only is what is the exact karmic cause and have an exact karmic result is a result is extremely difficult to determine. Only a Buddha can. But moreover, what is karma and what is not very difficult to determine. But His Holiness always says not everything is karma. The fact that you just have a mind, it's not karma. It just is. The fact that things change moment by moment is not anyone's karma. It just is. So these are some examples where certain facts are not the result of karma. They just are. But also, not everything is a result of karmic action, such as a karmic result ripens, because otherwise we couldn't make any decisions. They just be karma, ripen, karma, ripen, karma, ripen. So we find ourselves in a situation where there's a karmic result ripening and we have no time and no opportunity to choose and we have opportunities where a karma could potentially ripen but through our decisions we can avoid that okay or we can seek help when we get sick we have the karma to get sick but we may also have the karma to get better so to choose to go to the doctor and then to 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 seek help the, the, the thought I go should go to the doctor, I don't think that's a karma. It's the result of yeah. being taught by someone, but it's, of course everything is a result. So like, nothing exists independently. So it does depend on a previous, my, my parents maybe advising me, whenever you get sick, go to the doctor. So that influences me. But like I say, there is no independent I that makes an independent decision. So if you're looking for that, you're looking for the wrong thing. Does that make sense? So don't think like... I'm pretty much sure you're kind of going to ask, like, but it's always dependent on something other than myself. But then there is also no... On your mind. Pardon? Also on your, dependent on your mind. On my mind, on my memory, on my culture. Of course, the fact that, free, yes. If it's free, your free will, whether you then decide not to do anything about it, or whether you yeah. go to, let's say, Ayurvedic or natural yeah. remedies, or... Yeah, or exactly. So you may choose, so you, the, the, as she said, very nice. So she said, like, the disease is your karma, yes, that you get sick is a result of a karmic action. You don't agree? No. No? Because the act of, like, having the ability to, um, to, to know you're, you're sick, for example, like, Having a doctor nearby or having the, uh, uh, being allowed to to see a doctor is also a karma. You can be sick and of course, you of course. Know you're sick and okay, okay, karma. okay. You're sick is your karma. The 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 decision to go to see a doctor is your free will. But then whether it's a doctor nearby is your karma. Okay. It's, yeah. no, but it's, it's, it's like all your different. Your mental state at that point to go see a doctor is also dependent on your karma. No, it's, it's that you don't call karma. It's the experience. You see, we, you don't call everything a karma. Like it's the experience in a certain moment. But like to decide to practice the dharma, of course there are causes and conditions in the past. But it's a lot more complicated. Sometimes karma is almost like seen as a straitjacket. Karma. You're caught in your karma, right? <laughs> and so now you have this one karma, and you know, it, it's not like that. Karma is not, it's in each moment situations arise, of course, that lead to experiences, but because of other factors, we can also make decisions to go to the doctor or not, etc. So, uh, the karma, of course, is also involved in that, but I wouldn't say it affects that. The fact that I'm a human being is my karma, and a human being can make that decision, but that's only indirectly affected. But, but and I still have, I still have, 
the ability to make choices. But the moment you are saying, is there no free will, you bring in an independent I. There's never going to be an independent I that makes a decision or an independent mind that makes a decision. Okay? So don't look for an independent mind. A mind is dependent on many other factors. And even if you were to say, Any ex anything is my karma, well, you're still creating karma. You're the one creating the karma. So, therefore, if you want to see it that way, because it's very hard to determine how do you define karma and not karma. It's difficult. Usually we say an experience, but okay, how far is something an experience or not? So a lot of factors are the results of karma, but they were created by our own mind. So our mind keeps creating the causes, keeps creating the causes for future experiences, and then at some point we experience them, but we continue creating causes that will change the situation and, and allow us to, to make changes. So if not everything is karma, then there is randomness involved? No, but there's causes and conditions. Do you, do you remember I told, I said, there is the law of cause and effect, and the law of karma is only one, one type of law of cause and effect. A volitional action giving rise to a volitional result. But that doesn't mean that every cause and effect situation is part of that karmic event. So and like I said, even if it were, even if it were, okay, let's just say it were, we still have a relative free will. And since everything exists relatively, well, we are very good off with the relative free will. It's we like couldn't a, have a, a, an absolute free will. Absolute free will means like independent free will. And there's nothing that exists absolutely. Is subtle impermanence our karma? Our subtle, subtle impermanence is not our karma. Not our karma, but it, it's our dependent arising. It's a dependent arising. Subtle impermanence is dependent arising, but it's no one's karma. What's, no one has created the what's karma. What's the difference between karma and dependent arising? What is the difference between karma and dependent arising? <laughs> Big difference. Dependent arising includes the law of cause and effect, dependence on causes and conditions, but it also includes other dependences, <clears throat> dependence on a part, on something that, depending on a cause, the cause always precedes that which the thing depends on. But when I say I'm dependent on parts, those parts don't precede me, they're with me right now. Plus dependence on a mind labeling. That doesn't, also, that doesn't have to precede the existence of something. So interdependence is just saying phenomena depend on other things for a variety of different reasons. Okay? Karma is just a type of dependence on certain causes and conditions that happen to be volitional. So there's a difference. Dependent arising is the larger category that includes karma, but it includes even more. Wow, karma people are like, really <laughs> shooting now. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember okay. what you said with Geshe Like the story with Geshe Nam that told about this astrologer? Astrologer, uh-huh. Yeah, that, that he says that, that he, was, he can read maps of people and tell them what it was in the past. And then he can also, you know, if you read back, and then he did all these things and got a lot of money because he was able to do all of that. And then that he said that people who are practicing and doing purification practice, you cannot read your future. It's like impossible. Because you don't know, because these things, these practices, people that meditate and doing all these things, they, they, they change their, yeah. I think maybe for an astrologer it's impossible to tell their future. For someone who's a practitioner, they could still do that. No, no, like because they're practicing. Yeah, but because you're practicing, you're still creating causes and conditions and you can still know about what's going to happen. That doesn't make sense just because they're practicing. I don't believe that makes sense because you're making certain decisions nonetheless and you're purifying, you're adding, etc. So also for an ordinary person, we constantly make changes. I believe that maybe an astrologer can no longer do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But another, yeah, like a no, great no, practitioner could still... The future are more... Like, it's, it's less, less uh, predictable for them yeah. to... Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, they, yeah. They, can, they can create... This right. is in the relative change yes. things because they do that. And then it's easier that makes sense. Better. That makes sense to me in the sense it's more predictive, predictive like predictable. Like if someone... Because we actually act, react, act, react in a very similar way. But when we engage in Dharma practice, we may actually suddenly go beyond the ordinary kind of being trapped in the karmic experiences of our past by purifying, through purifying. But yeah. then how do the nose? 
Okay, never mind that. <laughs> <laughs> I talked about that before, but I'll, I'll address it I again. I have big so. problems. Yes, I know. You're not, <laughs> You're not the only one. It's, it's a natural problem, and I try and address it. Just not right now. Yes. 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 <laughs> I, I want to know your thoughts on there is an individual karma, and then through interdependence we are also connected. So there is a group or a collective karma as well, right? So collective karma is just a word. But collective a karma is just a word. Look, when we say collective karma, mm -hmm. it seems to suggest we all experience the same thing. But we don't. We never, ever do. But we have, we have the collective karma to be in this room right now, right? We, we have the karma to be in this room. So just from the point of view of being in the same room, we label collective karma to be in this room. But everyone's experience, when you really analyze, is very different. So you always have collective karma with someone. We all have the collective karma to be alive. We all have the collective karma to have a nose. We all have the collective karma to have a belly. We all have the collective karma. You see, in the end, it's, mainly, it's merely a label based on the fact that we share certain similarities. But what we misunderstand sometimes, it seems to suggest that we experience exactly the same. Okay? So we say collective karma when we come together as a group of people and have a relatively similar experience together. Okay? But actually, most of our... We, we always find a collective karma. I mean, I'm not able to put it across right, maybe. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, there's, there's one common purpose or a common goal to which we all are connected to. Yes, we have our individual, you know, free will as well. But to an extent, there comes a point when, you know, we... What is that common thing? Common goal? We want to be happy. Common goal, we all want to be happy. All right, the fact we all want to be happy, we share that. But your happiness will never be my happiness. My wish to be happy is not yours. So they're still different. But I'm working for your happiness and you're working for mine, right? Are you working for mine? That's <laughs> <a problem. laughs> If not, at least care to try that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. No, that's, yeah, that's, that, that, that's great. That's wonderful. That's very noble. And thank you very much. Don't stop. <laughs> but uh, no, what I'm trying to say is like, you see, this has a lot to do with labeling, right? When we say collective karma, we have something in common. Of course, we do to a certain extent. Like I say, for instance, you being a human and me being a human, we have that in common. But you are being a human and me being a human is still very different. Okay? So we just use the same word due to some similarity. Like we say, this is a table and that is a table. But that which makes this a table is very different from what makes that a table. So we use the same label, but that doesn't mean there's really something we can find that they have in common. Really, there's nothing we can find in and of itself that they have in common. It's just a label. Does that, come, does that make sense? Okay? So it's merely labeled in that way. Okay, please, go ahead. Sorry. I'm, I'm really interested in what you said about potentially ripening karma. Uh -huh. So that you mentioned the example the other day about like a plane going down and it's pretty screaming except for maybe a high lap and it's just like, ah, oh, time will get. My question is how much do you try to avoid possibly ripening karma before it's ripened, right? So like what's the plane has crashed like too late, you know, that's your karma. But I mean you try to avoid to get on a plane like that. You're not going to you're not going to kind of like, all right, it's, good, it's a good time for me now to meditate. I mean, you try to preserve your life as much as you can. But when you can't avoid it, you... you How do you know when you can't avoid it? At what point do you just sit? Well, I can avoid taking a selfie on a rock that's kind of like... Above, which could potentially, I don't know how solid the rock is, I could put, potentially put my life in danger, right? So to avoid potentially dangerous situation, life-threatening situation, because I don't want to risk it. Yeah. I mean, I can do so a certain degree, but sometimes I walk underneath the wrong building, you know, I get hit by a, by a stone or what have you, a flower pot, and that's it. Yeah. So in that moment, <laughs> if I have a few moments to think, to go, all right, time of death is there, one day we have to die. So without reacting with anger and, and, and great fear, if you can, to just go, all right, let go, let it be. So, okay? so like getting sick, like you might wash your hands. Oh, you always try to... Yeah, don't... I mean, if it's obsessive, you, like, you maybe get sick. Where is that? That's what I'm looking for. Is 
like Where's the middle way? I mean, the thing is, the middle way, that's all part of Buddhist practice, to find the middle way. To learn about Buddhism really extensively, to understand... And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions that have nothing to do much with the mind. Well, they all have to do with the mind, but in a more sense. Why do I do that? I do this on purpose for, because everything needs to make sense because everything is connected. It's like learning Buddhism is, is studying a huge puzzle with all the little puzzle pieces. So you learn each puzzle and then you learn how it all connects. And once you, you have all puzzle pieces, you have a sense of all of them, how they connect then you have a better sense of what is an extreme, what is another extreme, and where am I in a balanced state. But as long as we have self-grasping, which is always an extreme mind, and always sneaks in, we need to accept also that degree of extremity, of extremity or like not, that's not the right word, but of an extreme view. We also need to accept that and do the best we can. So the only person who no longer acts out of extreme Awareness is just the Buddha. But we can avoid worse, worse extremes, right? Like, for instance, overindulging versus torturing ourselves, stopping to eat and only meditating 24 hours. That's an extreme. Okay, so in your practice, very important. What I find so important in practice, when you practice the Dharma, you need to find a certain type of mind that is happy and content. The moment it's too happy and content, okay, like, oh, oh, I'm so comfortable. Don't want to sit up and meditate. Well, that's one extreme. The moment you're straining, you're getting uptight, you're tiring, that's another. Remain in the middle. The moment you uh, risk your life, that's one extreme, as in like going too many, too, too, too many dangers, but at the same time, you, you have to take a certain risk. I mean, coming to India to learn about the Dharma means you have to get on a plane. I mean, just leaving your house is a risk. Maybe in your house, being in your house is a risk. <laughs> right? I mean, certain decisions, they can be potentially life-threatening, but it'd be ridiculous to always try and avoid them or to wash your hand ten times. You probably get sicker by washing your hands too often because then the, the, the resistance disappears. So always try to find the best balance you can find and be accepting if sometimes you fall into extremes. I think that's the only answer I can give. Okay. Bow. So, there is a category of entities that is immensely useful to us and my question concerns the ontological character of these entities uh, in light of different types of consciousnesses. And the entities that I'm referring to are numbers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Numbers uh, it, is, it is said that it is virtually impossible for us to make sense of the world uh, if we did not have numbers. Okay. And uh, uh, numbers uh, do not seem to be causally dependent on other things, uh, at least in the sense that my body is causally dependent on other things in the world. So, how would you talk about numbers? Uh, in light of correct consciousness, mistaken consciousness, <laughs> right. object of apprehension, mm -hmm. object of engagement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, okay, numbers. Okay, I answered. Numbers. Very, I, I'm fascinated by numbers. What were these? What were, what, what, what were those three again? Do you remember? Nominalist. Nominalist? Um, what was the first one? Universally, right? F imagine, fictionary? Fictional? Fictional philosophy. Which one was the last one? Nomina was the second one. What was the first one? Platonism. Platonism. Platonist mathematics. Okay? There are those three views with regard to mathematics. Platonist mathematics, I guess, is the idea that numbers exist independent of time and space. Numbers exist independent of time and space. Then, now numbers are just fictionary. Just fictional. That's the other view. That is not the Buddhist view. The first one is the absolute view that there are absolute numbers. Somewhere, what does that even mean? There's like a very interesting documentary 
um, where someone asked, what does that even mean that numbers float in space and time? Please d bear with me. This is really interesting. I don't, I'm not a fan of mathematics, and still I find that interesting. So I'm sure you will after I finish. So numbers, what does it mean they float in time and space? Doesn't make any sense, really, from a Buddhist point of view. When we say numbers, do we mean they don't exist? No, that's another extreme. So actually numbers, the reason we have two and three and four, the reason we have those numbers is because there are two cups or two tables or something that has those numbers. So two objects of appearances, three objects of apprehensions. So two and three, the numbers in general, they're always dependent on something that can be counted. So it's like saying blue doesn't exist independently on something that is blue. Long doesn't exist independently. There's no universal blueness that pervades independently, exists somewhere out in space. There is no universal one. There is a conventional one because there's one cup, one table. There are things that can be counted. One, two, three, four, what have you. So therefore we say they exist conventionally. And even though there's no one to count them at the time of the dinosaurs, you can have 24 dinosaurs roaming around in a certain place. You don't have anyone to count them, but you can count them. There is, well, the dinosaurs themselves perceived each individually one, so therefore they existed. And later on, retrospectively, we can think of those dinosaurs and count 24. Okay? So those numbers don't exist independently of some entity. And he gives the example, for instance, for a child. How do numbers exist? How do we teach a child mathematics? We say, you have three pencils, and then five pencils. How many are those together? Eight. So you, they actually always relate to something, but we can con conceptually take them out, out of context, and start thinking of them separately. One, two, three, as an abstract. But that doesn't mean they exist in that way. <coughs> so therefore, numbers... There are two objects, like some minds have two appearing objects. Some have four, some have more. So you have all these numbers, but they're still labeled, conceptually labeled, and they are in, inseparable from a certain entity. Okay? So that is the, so therefore the Platonic, the Platonic is called, right? A mathematical view is the view of reification, is the view of inherent existence. Basically, they exist independently somehow, that is, the, that is the mathematical view of inherent existence. But that they're non-existent, that they're just fictional, that is the view of nihilism. And then there's the view of nominalism. That's the view of nominalism. And so some people argue, and Kate, you need to help me with that. I don't remember everything. I taught the whole lecture on it. It's not so long ago, and I forgot. So one part of it, the person who's describing this, he say, well, there's a problem with nominalism because you have numbers such as pi. He mentioned that, but he mentioned another one. What, what, what was the other criticism? One was pi. He's saying, if they're merely fictional, sorry, if they're merely nominal, nominal, how can you have that? Oh, infinity was the other one. Infinity was the second one. So he talks about, first of all, pi. He says, how can you have pi, something not being totally precise? What is it there that you can find that is not that precise? Well, definitely a radius of a circle. I mean, in order to get at that, you need to use pi. And imprecision is actually not a problem. Where does that table exactly start? Very imprecise when it gets down, gets down to. Where is the exact present moment? When is the exact moment when a seed becomes a sprout? What is that exact moment? When this, the leaf is this big, or this big, or that big, there's no precision. We cannot find any precision, right? Saying, when you, I, I usually give the, 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 the usual example, like, I, I, t I ask you to take a photograph of the process of a seed growing into a sprout. Take a photograph every second, and put up these photographs on long washing lines, okay? All the way. And now you need to choose the picture where the seed is no longer a seed, but it's a sprout. Is it picture 5,098? Is it picture 10,051? Whatever. Who can say? It's not precisely determined because it's up to us when we're going to call it a sprout or a seed. There is no precision. So no wonder there's pi. How can there be precision? There's no precision in anything. Same with past, present, and future. 
Seventh, when is the exact present moment? You can subdivide it and subdivide it. If you can't find a present moment, you don't find a past and a future moment. There's no precision in everyday life anyway, right? Maybe one and two, they seem very precise, but that is again just labeled. What are you exactly counting? We can take it apart and count differently. We can take it apart endlessly and, and end up with infinite numbers, right? So therefore, there's no problem with infinity. There's no problem with imprecise numbers because we get as close as we can get. Even words never convey the full truth. Always imprecise. So imprecision like pi is not, not a problem. So from a, a Buddhist point of view, of the two, platonic, platonism, fiction is, fictional mathematics, it's nominalistic. It's nominalistic. So that's the middle way. And it's interesting because we did that when we studied Pramanavatika just recently. Someone brought this up as part of the study of Pramanavatika. And I think numbers, it's, it applies to numbers in the same way as to everything else. Does that make sense? I like that idea a lot. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting, though I'm not a thing. I don't have a thing with numbers, actually. Yes. Earlier when you were using the terms meaning generality and sound generality, and you gave the example of the ocean, if it's someone who knows the word ocean and has never been to the ocean, but you show them a photo or a video of the ocean, can we then say that they have the meaning generality, or is it like a false version of it? If you show someone a photograph of the ocean or a picture of the ocean, a drawing or whatever, is that photograph the ocean? No, it's a conceptual. No, it's a photograph. It's a photograph. It's a photograph. It's an image that is not the actual thing, right? So they have no memory of the actual thing because whatever they've seen is never the actual thing. Does that make sense? So in order to really, exp I think it's necessary to, or at least they can conceptually conjure up a sense of like really understanding what it refers to. So just a photograph is not sufficient. Based on that two-dimensional photograph, they could come to the conclusion, get some understanding of that refers to. So then even without experiencing it, they could have a meaning generality of that. A photograph could help, but a photograph itself is not sufficient. Just that is not sufficient. Yes, yes, you? Yeah. I have a question. Um, you say that karma is uh, conditioned by a uh, volitional nature. And uh, so volitional is purely human. That's why mm. Volitional, we come to the factor of the mind that is called volition. Yes. Yes. So mm. the lower real system, you know, digital and animals, doesn't have this volitional aspect as far as animals. They do. They do? They do. But animals have volitional. Yeah. But there's, there's no good and bad, you know what I mean? There's no ethical in animals. But there's no ethical, there's no good and bad in general. It's yeah. only in relation to what we want yes. that we call good and bad. So they don't have this moral, you know... Um, compass, compass. Yes. So Doesn't does, matter. How does, yeah, Doesn't how, matter. How does the mind in these realms come to, come, come to human, ev uh, evolve somehow, if there is not this, you know, I mean... Because the volition aspect is very different from that. Oh, I, I see what you mean. Yeah. So, so, you see, karma is not about you understand that this is a positive action, and when you understand it, then it becomes a positive action. It doesn't work like that. It's the same with gravity. It's not like, unless you know what gravity is, things don't fall to the ground. Whether you know what gravity is or not, gravity is a law of nature, and it always work. So we, are, we, we have to adhere to the law of gravity, whether we understand it or not. It works for us, even an animal. You know, if an animal lets go of its bone, Right? Then the law of gravity will set in, even though they have no idea. It seems it's not fair. They don't know the bone is going to fall to the ground or, you know, the first time. But even though they don't know, it's going to happen. So if an animal, out of anger and aggression, and the good thing is an animal never has the same aggression that a human can have, they don't have, they can get angry. Of course, I've seen animals angry. They can get angry, and out of anger, they can harm maybe another living being. They don't, uh, they don't do genocide and stuff. So, um, but I mean, they, they may kill another animal, but the severity of the negative actions is never as bad as our negative actions. That potentially, our negative actions it can actually lead to murder out of jealousy. I don't think animals kill out of jealousy, for instance, which is a lot worse. But that doesn't mean that positive actions, if they benefit each other, they will still. I mean, sometimes elephants 
for instance, certain life form, they do benefit each other. And the thing is, like, that's why animal birth is not considered to be desirable, because if you're born as a certain animal, then you cannot really choose to make positive actions. You may not have that intelligence. And it may take a long time, once you're reborn as an animal, to be f at least reborn as a certain animal that is more engaging in positive actions, making certain choices. For instance, dolphins and elephants, like certain animals, they're seen to, they, they, they manifest a very strong social behavior, benefiting others, right? And then there are some animals that don't have that ability, and it's very hard to accumulate a lot of positive karma. Yes, please. You, um, this is a tricky question to me. Like mm -hmm. you say in Buddhism, at least um, some of you say that you can reincarnate into an animal. Yes. But as human, you create a very specific karma. Yes. Because you have moral suffering. That yeah. You can't find in animals, right? That you so can find? Moral suffering. More. 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 Moral. Moral, moral suffering. suffering. Uh, more okay. different, yes. And so let's say you're making someone suffer, and this, this person is going to have a lot more suffering because he did something very unethical. Mm. How could you write this karma in an animal mm -hmm. when there is no more suffering in animals? Well, it wouldn't ripen in an animal. Okay, so you will have to go back into humans, right? Well, I mean, the karma may purify because of, po like I said, our karma, we're not stuck with karma at all times. We can, through positive actions, purify that. And there's certain karma that only ripens as a human. There's certain karma that only ripens as an animal. And we have been animals, and we can become animals again. And as humans, we have certain sufferings that animals cannot have, absolutely. Um, we have advantages and disadvantages. Actually, to add to that, there are certain rebirths where you have very little suffering. It's kind of, they're called celestial rebirth. But they're not desirable. From a Buddhist point of view, as long as we still have suffering, it's good to experience a certain degree of suffering because that gives rise to a certain degree of renunciation. So just to add that, therefore, yes, as animals, there are certain restrictions, etc., and certain karmas cannot ripen. There's no moral compass. I don't think animals feel guilt. But guilt is not a good emotion. Feeling guilty is an extreme form of regret. It's no longer feeling regretful of the action, but hating yourself for the action. Again, with guilt, we cannot distinguish between the person and the action. That's a huge problem we have. Not distinguishing between person and action. For, it's always always says, forgive the person, don't forgive the action. But there's no problem with that, because the action is not a person. It's just, a neutral, it's just, a, it's just an action, an inanimate action as such course governed by a human being but is still not a living being so forgive yourself for your mistakes but understand that the action was wrong and try not to repeat it that is regret the moment you feel more like what you this kind of suffering that is an extreme emotion emotion it is a disruptive emotion it actually harms you and something we need to work on and i believe animals don't have that to that degree yes Great. Yes. Uh, there are certain uh, philosophies such as yoga, which share same vocabulary yes. as karma, and so there is no, uh, there the phenomena and the self are the same. So from that point of view, could uh, subtle impermanence mean uh, karma? What, what in this tradition they say what? There's no difference between karma and subtle impermanence. No. Uh, in yoga philosophy, there yeah. is uh, the self and the phenomena are the same. Self and the phenomenon. What phenomenon? Uh, the universe. The universe and the self are the same? Yeah. You and I are the same? Yeah, according to that philosophy. <laughs> how do they account for that? How, how come that you look differently? You look different. No, but same, there is a... Same nature. I think they are the same nature. Ah, oh, Buddhists say that. Well, the same nature. We are all... As an individual, we have an Atman, which is our Correct. absolute truth. Uh -huh. And then there is a universal... Uh, absolute truth which is Brahman okay. so they are of the same nature I don't think they are of the same that. nature as in like in Buddhism you don't say we are of the same nature as such but we are all the same in lacking inherent existence mm -hmm. we all share the fact that we share the same nature as the nature of emptiness so in that sense you could say that but that doesn't make us 
That's just, it's a slightly different philosophy. And yes. the Buddhists and the non-Buddhists have spent a lot of years deba debating with each other. And I guess you should look at those debates if you're interested, if you're drawn to one of the two systems, and just choose the one that makes more sense to you. Same thing like oneness or one energy, and we are all part of that. Energy. Yes, we had these discussions before. They do exist, I mean, right now with the Pramanavatika, the text that I'm translating and teaching. So the Vaisheshikas, it's one system. They have a very strong view of a universality, of like a an all-pervasive <laughs> universe, and Buddhists don't accept that. It's like an absolutism versus a nominalism that Buddhists accept. So in the end, I think you should analyze both, and in the end, whichever works better for you, right? So in Buddhism, uh, intention is required for something to be karma. Yes, very good. Intention is required, plus a mind is required. So any physical or verbal action, for instance, if you step on an animal without knowing that you do that, you do not occur the karma of killing. You need to at least have the motivation to kill. But if your motivation is a positive one and you still want to kill, in the case of euthanasia, there's still some negativity. Although there's only a very slight negativity and it's, it's mainly positive because you want to help the other person, but there is the motivation to kill versus not knowing you're actually killing an animal and then you do not uh, you, you do not accumulate the karma of killing. So yes, it's very important and we'll come to this. This is part of the explanation of the mind. Which aspect of the mind is responsible for karma? Coming out. Uh, small clarification. Did you say that the alternate traits of one object is one nature with an alternate truth of another object? I thought it was the same object, like conventional alternate truth. Well, the, the, when we say... Actually, we are the same in the sense of lacking inherent existence. From that perspective, we don't differ. But just from that perspective. Like the one type of sameness, yeah. Pardon? Like, it's just like that's one type of sameness? No, no, no. We're not saying that his emptiness is mine and mine is his. That's not yeah. what we're saying. No, no, no. No, 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 no. It's just from that, the way he expressed it, as in like we're just one from that. So from the way he thought of being one, from that perspective, we could also say... We are all one, we are all the same in that we lack inherent existence. But strictly speaking, from a Buddhist point of view, we're still different. So there's a slightly different way of using the vocabulary. I'm pretty sure that a lot of these philosophical systems just lose the words slightly differently. They use words, I mean, not in all cases, but they may use the vocabulary slightly differently, which seems to suggest something that is in contradiction to Buddhism. But I'm not sure it always is the case. But they still debate with each other because maybe the Buddhists say, well, don't use that word. It can be misconstrued. <laughs> and the others say, no, don't use the Buddhist vocabulary. You are misunderstood. Yeah, it's so, the same emotion. Buddhists, they say that all human beings, all beings have been their mothers and at one point of life to generate compassion. But that is true. Yeah. So, if we've all been... This is not true. That, this is not saying that all sentient beings are the same. When she was my mother, someone else wasn't. Uh, so, But everyone has, at some point in time, been very close to me, has been my mother at some point in time, but that's not saying that they were all equally my mother so in the sense that... context, same emotion is being generated, or compassion. Yeah, that is true. It's just a, 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 the thinking of the fact that everyone has at some point been very close to me, I've just forgotten about it, and then as a result of that, I feel the same kind of compassion towards any, any person I could think of as a result of that. Yes, that is true. All right. Okay. Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nikita, last. Um, I just want to know, like, when we talk about life paths, yes? we talk about karma and karma and life path. Yes. So what is, your, what is the Buddhist understanding of, like, the life path that we are meant to follow? Like Meant to follow? Who determines... No, that's exactly, I mean, when we come here, the first thing you all, people say is that it's your karma that's brought you here, which means that there is some form of, of a life path, that you're going to be a doctor, a teacher. No, no, no. But that is, this kind of, this way of talking implies there is someone guiding you as like God, for instance. It doesn't really work like that. You see, we like to think, sometimes we like to think, for instance, it's, I meant to. I meant to experience this. I meant to experience that, which seems to mean there's a greater purpose behind that. Only if you make a purpose out of it. 
Only if you may. So we experience karma. We experience the actions of the past. And it's not like someone says, oh, she could learn something from it. So I'm going to make sure she's going to be a woman or a man. You created the karma to be a woman or a man. You did that. No one else did, right? Of course, because of other people, etc. So, But you created your own your own situation, right? But you have the choice to make it meaningful, what you have, or to, I mean, just the fact you're here, etc. You have accumulated a lot of positive karma. You have a lot of options and a lot of freedoms. Um, and so, therefore, it's up to you to use that or to waste it. So, when we say it's our karma to be here, there's no contradiction. Yes, it's our karma to be here. We accumulated the causes and conditions to have this experience, but there's no contradiction. There's no contradiction with regard to um, no one has brought us, like no external force has determined we should be here. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we come from... A background, we come oftentimes, and I don't say you are, but in the West, we're so used to God. We're so used to the principle of a creator God who's put us in this situation. And it often slips into our conviction with regard to Buddhist practice. We can't help it. So I catch myself thinking, oh, maybe it was meant to happen. Mm-hmm. It, it's not like someone's written my fate and it was meant to happen. No, 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 no one can choose in the Pardo unless you're a highly realized being. You don't choose anything in the Pardo. You cannot use the Pardo. You cannot use the Pardo. It's it's like it's a really highly evolved practice. When you get in the Pardo, you're just driven. It's like a dream. In our dreams, we're usually driven. You can learn lucid dreaming, yes, but the Pardo is a lot subtler. And to learn lucid Pardo, you, you have to be a highly evolved uh, being, right? So we can only really utilize the waking state, and you're doing that all the time. You're creating your your causes for the future all the time, right? So it's there's no fate, there's not when to be there. We're just creating this. We are, we are like, as Rinpoche said on Monday, if you were here, we are our own protector, right? We are our own protector. Who else is there to protect us? But it, then it goes on. We are own, We are our own enemy, <laughs> We are the ones that create our problems. We are our own protector. Yeah. So all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, etc., all these beings, they can assist us. But their ability to assist us goes only that far. Just as a doctor can only prescribe us, can assist us, but we still have to take the medicine. We are the ones who have to take care of our diet. We are the ones who have to exercise. We have to do all, all of this. All right, let's just leave it. Just let leave it for now. I want to go a little bit. Please wait um, until next time. So I want to go a little bit further. I know it's, we haven't done that much, but honestly, the le- the rest is not that hard. So I'm very confident we can finish five pages every day, and then we easily finish until the end of class, even more than five. We did already more than well five this morning. Okay. So, <laughs> no, that's fine, don't worry about it. All right, so a little bit, let's do a little bit of this here. So, again, going back to how we gain knowledge, how we gain understanding, and we understand the importance of, of knowledge, right? Understanding reality, of course, because there's nothing, our main problem is really not understanding reality. So, inferential cognizers are important, therefore... Um, where do we get to? 35. Oh, 35, that's right. Even though valid cognizers, that is mind that realize their objects, are categorized into direct and inferential valid cognizers, there are valid cognizers that are neither of the two. For instance, the meditative stabilization, that is a union of calm abiding and special insight, and that realizes emptiness conceptually. For instance, on the path of preparation, which we haven't talked about yet. So when you bring together meditative stabilization, your mind is very stable and you have an understanding, special insight into emptiness, 
if you realize that conceptually, that's a valid cognizer, but it's neither a direct valid cognizer nor an inferential cognizer because you don't need to depend on reasoning in that moment. It's because you're so familiar with the object. Now, these were a lot of terms that are in there that you don't understand yet. Union of calm, abiding, and special insight. It's, it, 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 because it came up before, that's why it's mentioned here again, it's really just saying bringing together your understanding with a deep level of concentration. You combine uh, understanding of reality with a deep level of concentration. You combine those two. So you realize a fact such as emptiness, and, and you do so with this very focused mind. That's called this union of calm abiding and special insight. But it's because you're so familiar with the object, so you no longer depend on reasoning, because the reasoning you've done long ago, so you no longer need to go through the reasoning. And it's not a direct perceiver yet, because it's still conceptual. But like I said, we'll discuss this in more detail. It is not a direct valid cognizer, because it's a conceptual, conceptual consciousness, and it's not an inferential cognizer, because it does not realize its object in dependence on the correct reason, but in dependence on intense meditation. Okay. So what are non-valid cognizers? There are awarenesses that do not realize their objects. So examples of such are, the first one you already know, awarenesses to which the object appears but is not ascertained. We all know that. Wrong consciousnesses, you know. Now we have two other ones that you all, it's very easy, but we haven't mentioned them yet. A doubting consciousness. It's doubting. It's undecided. undecided. Maybe it's like this. Maybe it's like that. Right? We've got lots of those. We don't, we're undecided about past and future lives, possibly, or about emptiness. Correctly assuming consciousnesses. So after some indecision, and before we can realize something, we have conviction. We correctly assume, which is another way of saying being convinced of something that is actually in accordance with reality, and now we're convinced of it. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. So the first two were explained before. And then doubting consciousness. So you, really it's like all about valid cognizer, non-valid cognizer. And then you see how they all overlap. Correct, incorrect. Mistaken, non-mistaken. So that was part of your exercise. How do they all interact? Give me something that's mistaken, but not a wrong consciousness. Posit something, right? And then you need to really understand how they work. Show me something that is a non-valid cognizer and a wrong consciousness. Show me something that is a non-valid, or posit something that is a non-valid cognizer, but a correct consciousness. Right? Okay. So in that way, if you do this long enough, it becomes second nature. And you'll, you'll never forget. I did this so many years ago. But we, we did this over and over, all these exercises. Now I don't forget. Doubting consciousnesses are conceptual awarenesses. So you'll never have a sense consciousness that doubts. Okay? That are two-pointed, maybe even three-pointed. Maybe this, maybe this, maybe that. But at least two-pointed. And waver with respect to the object of engagement. Examples of doubting consciousnesses are a conceptual awareness that doubts Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, for instance. Or a conceptual awareness that doubts the law of karma. Or a conceptual consciousness that doubts that Buddha exists and so forth. I mean, assuming that he does and assuming that there's karma. And of course, the theory uh, there's evolution or the, evolu the theory of the evolution as set forth by Charles Darwin's Accords with Reality. And doubting consciousness are threefold. Doubt that tends away from the fact, doubt that tends towards the fact, and equal doubt. Makes sense, right? Maybe the, the earth is round. Maybe it's not. It probably it's not. And tending away from the fact, right? Maybe it's round. Maybe it's not round. It probably is round. Doubt tending towards the fact. And then maybe it's, maybe it's not feeling both ways equally. That is equal doubt. So it's like the intensity of the doubt. It's the intensity of the doubt, but also the conclusion you come to. Probably the earth is round. Probably not. Oh, I don't know. Either way. Okay? All right. Taking the example of doubt toward the ultimate nature of phenomena, that doubt that tends away from the fact is a two-pointed conceptual awareness that thinks that phenomena probably exist intrinsically. Right? We start off with that, like, oh, maybe they exist intrinsically, maybe not. Probably they exist intrinsically, because we're used to it. That that tends away towards the fact is a two-pointed conceptual consciousness that thinks that phenomena are probably empty of existing intrinsically. And equal doubt is two-pointed. You see, it's pretty straightforward. It's not difficult to understand. 
Okay. It's a conceptual mind. Is it mistaken or non-mistaken? Mistaken. It's mistaken. Does that make sense? Why is it mistaken? Because appearance of inherent existence. Is it a valid cognizer? No. Why not? It doesn't realize its object. Very good. Um, very good. Is it direct? Is it a sense consciousness? No. 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 Because it's doubt. Very good. You all get it. Most of you. The ones who answer. <laughs> but I didn't see any confusion. The other ones seem to agree. <laughs> right? It's just, it's not that hard. It's just a little complicated. Oh. <laughs> Could someone have a look at whether the taxi is standing there? Because if it's not yeah, there, I didn't hear yes, anything. Yes. Oh, he's there? Okay, I don't want to let him wait. Thank you. Thank you for that. I don't want to let him wait, so I better leave it now. So... Your mind is full. We'll continue tomorrow. Please read ahead a little bit. We're still getting to mind and mental factors. And although it's not that hard, but it's a little complicated. And tomorrow we have our entire, like a whole day, like a long, long day again. As like, I'll teach until six. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow. Okay.